second squares. And what I want to know is the shear stress tau which you need to move this block. So imagine it is a huge block of sandstone, 1.5 meters high. It's enormous, it's very, very heavy. And I'm asking you the stress to move it. The answer to this question is in fact very simple. Because the normal stress is the density times the acceleration of gravity times the height of the block, which is 2,200 times 9.8 times 1.5, remember 1.5 meter, which is 0 0.03 megapascals, 0 0.03 million pascals. So in fact, this is a very, very small stress. It is less than the atmospheric pressure. So to move this sandstone block, the force is very big. But if you divide it by the area of this sandstone block, becomes actually a very, very small stress. And this is the way the calculation goes. This is the normal stress here, and if you count, if you multiply with the friction coefficient, you get 0 0.0275 megapascals. Friction is one of the central parameters which control the tectonics in the upper crust stay in the upper 10 kilometers of the Earth. And friction, at the very first approximation, is in fact a rather simple thing in the Earth, because the friction coefficients between many, many different rocks are actually quite similar. And this is illustrated by a very, very famous diagram uh, worked out in the 70s by Wiergeen, uh, and what he did is he measured normal stress versus a shear stress for sliding many, many different kinds of rocks against each other. And what he found is that the friction coefficients between sandstone and granite and limestone and uh, basalts are very, very similar, with a few exceptions, which are, for example, clays. You know that clays have a very low friction coefficients. And this is called Pyre's law. And in the same place where we made these like, crazy friction photographs, I put a piece of stone on this slope, and it was in equilibrium, it didn't move. And now I can stand on it, and it still doesn't move. Because just I'd like to explain to you, the only thing which counts is the angle. It is not the actual force. Okay? So although I do like I'm actually surfing down the mountain, the thing is below this friction angle and therefore it doesn't slide. Okay. So now we've learned a little bit about friction. We have learned this very simple calculation of how to calculate this in the shear stresses in the sandstone. If you want to go into the earth, then we can use very similar principles and equations. And to do that, I made a simple diagram for you. So imagine now a drill core or a section into the earth. So this section is going down, maybe to two kilometers, like in the Aden borehole, which we have uh, drilled here a couple of years ago. And you see here is the sandstone and the gray are sandstone <coughs> layers. And I assume that the density of all this material is the same. Then there are all kinds of stresses, and I will explain to you this in more detail in later slides. But now I'm only interested in the vertical stress, the vertical component of the stress, and this is calculated by the density multiplied by the acceleration of gravity times the depth, if the density is constant. This is a very, very simple formula to calculate the vertical stress in the graph. And one of the things that I think you should do at home is to sit down and calculate for me why density, which is kilogram per cubic meter times gravity acceleration, meter per second square, times depth, meters, gives you pascals as a unit. So try to work out why the dimensions of the left side and the right side of the equation are the same. Now, if I go into a real sedimentary basin, of course the densities of my layers are different. And then, 
what you do is you can calculate the vertical stress at the base of each of these layers. Okay, that is the vertical stress at the top of the layer. That's one. Plus the thickness of the layer times the acceleration of gravity times the density. So what you do is you slice the Earth up into little slices and you calculate the increments in vertical stress and you add them up. This is a calculation which is made in industry all the time. Every time a geologist plant a well, you have to calculate the vertical stress. So this is vertical stress. And vertical stress in the Earth is normally a very simple function. It is a smooth function. It is not a straight line, because it would be a straight line if density was constant, but density changes all the time. So I made an illustration here where density increases this depth. The horizontal stress, which is the green line here, is much more complicated. In simple sedimentary basins, for example, it varies with the kind of layer you have. If you have a sandstone, the horizontal stress is rather low, and if you have a clay stone, it can be quite high. But the clay stones have a high stress. This is something that you, for example, find in the North Sea all the time if you do the else and you measure stresses. So the horizontal stress is not something that you can simply calculate. There are ways to measure it, and in fact it is very, very difficult to really predict it accurately. But you can measure it by putting tools in boreholes, you can measure it by using earthquake data. And these stress measurements and the techniques of this I'm going to explain to you in next year's course, but now you just have to assume that we can measure stress, are compiled, compiled worldwide in the World Stress Map Database. The World Stress Map Database is a database which is in Karlsruhe, at the University of Karlsruhe. You can go to the website and you can download the horizontal stresses in the Earth at any given point from data which people have contributed to it. So here is a picture. You can make this for yourself. And I would like to ask you to go there as a homeowner and make a stress map of your hometown or from the place that you are interested in. This is Germany. This is, we are here somewhere. Okay. And there are different colors which represent normal faulting, reverse faulting and strike state faulting. We will get back to those uh, uh, ideas later in the course. And these little lines give you the maximum horizontal stress. So this is really a map of the directions of the stress, for example, in Germany. And one of the very very fundamental insights that we got about 15 years ago from the World Stress Map Database, that was at the scale of continents, there are rather simple patterns. For example, if you look at North America, then on the east coast, the stresses are more or less north, east, south, west. In the Rocky Mountains, in Canada, the stresses are more or less the same direction and very parallel. If you go to the San Andreas Faults, the stresses have rotated, and they are the stresses which belong to the motion of the San Andreas Fault. Some areas are normal faulting because they are actually moving apart. Some areas are strike slip faulting. Of course, you know the San Andreas Fault is a strike slip fault. And other areas are truss faulting, which is very well explained by the fact that you are looking at the compressional mountain belt in the Rocky Mountains. So, just one illustration of how you measure these stresses, uh, which I would like to give you, um, uses volcanic intrusions and the dikes around volcanic intrusions. And to be able to follow the argumentation, uh, I would like to ask you to consider the stresses on the free surface. So now we, we don't talk about a block, and we don't talk about inside the block, but the piece of the earth which is stressed, and there is a free surface, like a cut. 
samples. And I think that you will agree with me that the free surface cannot have a shear stress on it because there is nothing that is able to shear there. So a free surface means that the stress is always normal. The principal stress is normal. To it. There is no shear stress on the free surface. And if you keep that in mind, and you now consider a hole in the earth, which is filled with some high pressure magma, like the center of the volcano. And the pressure of this magma is so high that it can really change the stress in the earth. And then what you are going to get is that the principal stresses, sigma one here, okay, are going to be distributed radially. So the stress around this volcanic pipe is not homogeneous anymore. It varies from place to place and it is radially symmetric. The normal stress on the wall is also the principal stress away from the wall. And if the pressure of the magma is high enough, it is actually able to fracture the rock. And the rock is going to fracture in the direction in which it is easiest to push it apart. So the smaller stress smallest principal stress, sigma k, that is going to be the direction to which the fracture is known. So what you expect if you have the earth and the magma is going through this volcanic pipe, that the dikes are going to be radially symmetric. And what you're getting is exactly that. This is a geological map of the dike mountain intrusion. This is the intrusion, and these are the dikes around it, beautifully arranged in a circular radial symmetric pattern. The picture is, in fact, easily visible using Google Earth. Please go there. Uh, we have on our website the location of these uh, dikes. It is in the western United States. This is the volcano, and in the satellite picture, you can actually see these dikes. We went there on one of our uh, geological excursions a couple of years ago, and it is really quite spectacular. Here on the right side is the mountain, and this line here is in fact like a wall. It is a bike which, which has been exposed by erosion. Here is a close-up. It is just a few meters wide. And there's a huge hole which is sticking out of the ground. Here is again another illustration. These are the Spanish peaks. This is the volcanic center, and here is one of these dikes moving away from it. In an aerial photograph, it looks like this. These are really very, very thin dikes which have intruded from this volcanic center into the country rock, and the pattern is radially symmetric, close to the volcano, but far away. Yeah, the hole doesn't have so much effect on the stress field. They occur in parallelism. So, in fact, you can use the pattern of the dikes to derive to derive the directions of the paleo stress of the stress during the intrusion of this volcano into the crust. Now, I will go and talk a little bit about the effect of water. Water is, an, is, a, is a phase which is present in the earth in many, many different places in the crust, in the pores of the rocks. And this water has a pressure, and this pressure has a very, very important